Hi, and welcome to The Communicators. On this week's program, you will hear from programming and cable leaders who attended this year's cable show that was sponsored by the National Cable and Telecommunications Association. Later on in this program, you'll get the perspectives of a small cable operator and an international cable operator. But first up, we hear from Philippe Domon, the head of Viacom. Comedy Central, TV Land, Paramount, BET, MTV are just some of the brands under the Viacom umbrella, and the man in charge of that is Philippe Domon. He is the president and CEO of Viacom, and he is joining us here at the National Cable Show on the Communicators program. Mr. Domon, on your website, you describe yourselves as an entertainment content company with multi-platform properties. What, what does that mean? Well, what it means is we have a wide variety of great brands, you named some of them, and we want to reach consumers wherever they are. So we have our brands on air, on your television screen, online, on your computer screen, on mobile, on every mobile device imaginable. And by the way, we also have our brands and our characters available in a lot of consumer products, SpongeBob being a great example of that. It, how, has, how has that changed in the past five years and how do you see it changing in the next five years? Well, consumers have the ability with all the great technology that's uh, coming out now to enjoy content and entertainment in many more ways wherever they are. And they're spending more time with content. Television viewing is up, so it's not that that's diminishing and going to uh, other categories. Uh, and, but now they're able to enjoy entertainment online and on their mobile phones when they're, they're on the go. So it's great for a pure content player such as Viacom because uh, we have many more ways to show our content to more people, not just here in the U.S., but around the world. You know, through broadband, we have access to consumers in countries where we are not able to have access for regulatory or other reasons to the television set. But where are the revenue streams if people are watching it free on the internet or, or on their mobile device? Well, what, you how have, does that uh, on the internet, you have an ad supported model for uh, video viewing. It's not as robust, the, the, the cost per minute of advertising is high, uh, as high as on air, if not higher in some cases. There's less advertising online. Um, but there's also subscription model uh, possibilities for certain types of programming online or a you know, premium type of programming. There's download to own. You can now buy a movie online and that avoids replication costs for us and making a DVD. That's growing very fast. Uh, for, for us, download to own revenues doubled in the last quarter compared to the prior year. It's still small, but it's growing. So it just opens up a lot more possibilities for the consumer and for purveyors of content such as Viacom. Do you see a, a time when uh, you start charging for everything online, just as uh, television is supported either by advertising or by a subscriber fee? Well, um, there's a lot of experimentation that will take place about uh, not just the technology, but how to monetize the technology. There are a lot of conversations uh, going on with distributors now about this uh, so-called TV Anywhere concept where you pay the monthly subscription fee you're used to paying now and you can uh, watch the content either in your television set or on your computer or through other devices and by the way in the future you probably will see some convergence of devices over time and uh, so that affiliate revenue stream that goes to content providers such as ourselves will continue in one form or another advertising subsidizes uh, all of our viewing, all of our enjoyment. The advertisers are paying for a lot of these uh, costs of producing these great programs, great movies. And uh, there'll be merchandising opportunities. You know, people will want to get the clothes that uh, the, the star on the hills uh, wears, and we will try to take advantage of that. With more interactivity that technology offers, uh, you'll be able to do more of that. Now, when it comes to online uh, video services, Viacom has been involved uh, in a lawsuit. What is the status of that? Well, uh, we're in, in discovery with a lawsuit uh, against YouTube, which we filed a couple of years ago, uh, really because uh, we do make our content available through many distributors online uh, and otherwise under licensing arrangements. 
where we have economic arrangements uh, relating to our content and uh, also some definition. We want to make sure that, that our content is presented in a high quality way. Um, and at the time, our content was being taken for free without any kind of arrangement by uh, YouTube and uh, Google, so we were uh, forced to be in a position to file this uh, lawsuit. I'm sure it'll be resolved one way or the other, in court or otherwise, and uh, I'm happy to see that uh, since the time of filing our lawsuit, the dialogue has moved toward protecting intellectual property online as well as everywhere else, again, to make it possible for us to create content. And you'll see even on YouTube a lot of filtering of professional content on a going forward basis. So I'm happy to see that the issues we raised have now penetrated the general marketplace. Well, with the online video services that are available and all the different platforms that are available, the business models in this industry are changing. What, does Viacom, do you have to change your business model on a regular basis? And, and what kind of guidance do you give to your senior managers? Well, the first guidance is always make great content. Even these tough economic times where we have to cut back, get more efficient, the one place we shouldn't cut back is on providing a great experience for our viewers or our consumers online or anywhere else. So that, that has to be the number one focus. And we know that if we have great content, that we will be able to find a way to reach the consumer and benefit from our relationship with the consumer no matter what the technology. Technology just enables our content to get to the consumer. And, uh, and, and that should, they shouldn't have to worry about what our arrangements are with all the companies in between. You know, that's something that we, uh, that we need to work out. There's a lot of experimentation going on right now and, and we want to experiment with everybody. But it's very good news for the consumer because uh, the way we'll work out is they'll be able to enjoy more and more content in many different ways. Well, we're here in Washington at the uh, annual cable show. When you're in Washington, do you meet with members of Congress about any regulatory issues that concern Viacom? Yes, well, actually, I spent the day yesterday uh, on the Hill, met with uh, many senators and, and congressmen and women. and. Uh, uh, I was there with uh, the U.S. head of the Gates Foundation, actually, to tell them about our Get Schooled initiative, which we are going to be officially launching um, on September 8th. We're going to uh, have programming across all of our many networks uh, simultaneously with big local events. It's part of a multi-year effort in partnership with the Gates Foundation to use the power of our brands and our reach to consumers to promote the cause of improving high school graduation rates and, and post high school education and graduation, particularly in underprivileged communities. So it really ties into the political agenda. It's uh, something that needs to be done. And we have the ability to reach young consumers through MTV, through Nickelodeon, through BT, through our many brands that can really help make change a reality here. So it's, it's a nice issue to talk about and it's great to be doing good as you try to do well, even in a tough environment. Do you see uh, decency as an issue coming back up in Congress or the FCC? Uh, I, I think there's uh, far too much attention paid to that as far as what appears on, uh, on television. When you look at a world where there's so much accessible online, it uh, seems that in the prior administration there may have been too much focus on small snippets of content that appear on many hundreds of networks that run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, when there is uh, so much more objectionable content that's easily available and uncontrollable online. So I think it's an antiquated debate. The uh, programmers such as ourselves are very responsible. We, we're very much in touch with our audience. That's not to say that occasionally something won't slip through or, or that uh, some people will be offended no matter what you do. But we're very proud of our, our programming. We have uh, very good uh, standards and practices. Uh, and I think they're much more important uh, areas for the regulators to focus on today than, uh, than, than that issue. Philippe Doma is president and CEO of Viacom. Thank you for being on The Communicator. Peter, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Up next, you're going to hear from two cable operators. First up, we're going to hear from Amy Tykeson. She is the head of Ben Broadband, which is located in Bend, Oregon.
We continue our discussion with cable television providers here at the Cable Show in Washington, D.C., and now joining us is Amy Tykeson, who is the president and CEO of Bend Broadband, which is out of Bend, Oregon, That's correct? correct? Small cable operator? Yes. How many subscribers do you have? We have about 36,000 uh, video, and about 80% of those, uh, Peter, take our high-speed products. So what's it like to run a small operation like that in terms, uh, compared to some of the bigger ones like Comcast or Cox? Well, I think from my perspective, uh, being in the community that we provide service to is wonderfully uh, rewarding. Uh, knowing my employees who are all ambassadors and uh, out there uh, involved uh, in the community is, is really terrific. Do you have the same issues of concern that a Comcast or a Cox or a Fios would? Of course. Uh, I think that the, uh, but we also have some things that offset our scale disadvantages for being small, of course. Uh, we aren't public and we can continue to invest without um, having to worry about the short run as much. We can make the decisions for the long term, what's best for our consumers and what's best for our company. But, uh, you know, it's a great business, Peter. I've been involved for, oh, gee whiz, I hate to admit it, but about 30 years now. Um, and it continues to amaze me, the technology and how the cable industry continues to reinvent itself and remain relevant and uh, amongst our consumer base. Uh, with unemployment as high as it is, especially in Oregon, yes. have you had a loss of revenue and loss of subscribers or people cutting back on cable? Um, we will be. Uh, we will continue to grow revenue and cash flow this year, but the uh, rate of growth has definitely slowed. As you know, in Central Oregon, our uh, population has grown about 40 percent since the year 2000. Uh, so we have a lot of uh, new residents in the area, which has really helped. Uh, you know, certainly our growth. Uh, broadband is a is a great. Um, driver for economic development and, and so forth but uh, there's no question that our uh, our customers are feeling are feeling it uh, we we've done a number of things this year to try to mitigate uh, what we can in terms of uh, uh, really limiting our rate increases you know our rate uh, rate changes are affected by the programming we carry and and so forth so we've really tried to minimize that uh, pass along as little as we can to our customers and our, our employees have been terrific supporters of that agreeing to uh, we have wage and uh, wage freeze across the uh, company and so forth to try to really um, make sure we continue to provide the best value with the triple play and the services that we offer when did you change the name to broad Ben broadband and why well we were as you know uh, we started out the company's 50 years old and it was uh, Bend TV cable uh, then Ben Cable Communications, and about four years ago, uh, four to five years ago now, uh, we felt that the cable didn't capture it anymore in terms of what we were offering. Uh, we were the first in Oregon to offer high-speed broadband back in 97, and we really we uh, have served, that's been a magnet for Central Oregon economic development, as I mentioned. And so the name, Ben Broadband, really made more sense to give us some headroom in terms of our, our growth and what we really provide. So. Uh, is the, the growth more in non-video products rather than video? Well, video, as you know, it's a mature product. Uh, cable television has been around since the 40s, late 40s, I think, the first uh, system. So even though we continue to make incredible enhancements, we have over 80 high-definition channels in, in, or in, in our system, more than any other cable system in Oregon. Um, uh, and VOD, hours and hours of that, et cetera. So we continue to incrementally improve the video experience with DVRs and giving people more choice and flexibility. But there's no question that the broadband product is a must-have for really everyone. And I think that's why the government is so keenly focused on making sure that uh, broadband ubiquity um, occurs in America. And when a decision, speaking of uh, decisions made in Washington, yeah. um, will you get economic stimulus plans, uh, uh, monies at Ben Broadband? Well, I think the, uh, the question uh, that we're debating is um, what we don't know. We don't know what the rules are yet. They haven't been established. I, I think if the intent of the program really is what I am interpreting it as, which is to make sure that we have 
ubiquitous broadband, as I mentioned. Everyone can have access to broadband. We know about 8 to 10 percent of homes don't have broadband at all. They're unserved. Do they have access? No access, period. And so that is where we believe the government's uh, money should be focused because those people don't even have um, any choice at this point. I think the other uh, category that has some uh, upside is uh, in underserved populations where uh, broadband may be available, but people may not have a computer or they may not know how to use it. And so I think um, those kinds of programs probably would do more to move the needle in terms of broadband um, adoption. Unserved and underserved populations would be where we would, uh, where we would focus. Being on the other coast, how closely do you pay attention to what Washington does, what Congress does, what the FCC does? Um, I'm fortunate to be um, involved as a member of the NCTA, and of course I'm a C-SPAN board member, um, and so I do follow it very closely. Um, we, we are impacted by uh, the decisions that are made by our lawmakers. Uh, we, we want a level playing field. We, we want to continue to have a robust small business and provide great jobs. And so uh, we aren't in favor of a lot of extra regulations. I think when you look at how much has been invested in, our, in the cable industry in the past 10 years, it's been significant. And it's all private risk capital, no government money. And, we've, uh, so, and we continue to innovate. We, are, we invest um, significant dollars have been broadband every year, and we're not slowing down on that. We're being a little smarter, working a little harder with our vendors. Uh, but we're continuing to invest because the cycle for this technology implementation, it's not an overnight deal. It takes several years to, to provide some of these things and we need to be ready for, for the downturn will be over and we want to be positioned uh, when that happens. Amy Tykeson, one of the issues that's been debated and discussed here in Washington for a couple of years is net neutrality or network management or pipeline management, however you want to phrase it. Yeah. Uh, what's your position? Well, um, at Venn Broadband, we've been, um, you know, I think we, uh, we're trying to manage consumption of the, uh, of the internet to some degree because there is a cost to that. If everybody is, is downloading giant HD files at the same time, our network can't support that. There's no economic model to do that. So we're trying to work with our customers with, um, in terms of accountability to some uh, extent of what goes on with the usage. Um, but, you know, my feeling is there is no problem with it now. Nobody is blocking content. The, there's competition. I don't see why that is an issue, to tell you the truth, because uh, if, we're, if we're a bad actor or anybody is a bad actor, customers will take their dollars and they'll vote elsewhere. And certainly we don't want that to happen. So our goal is to provide the fastest network, the most reliable network, and the best customer experience for everybody. And that's really what we're focused on and trying to work with our customers to make that happen with our investments. In your view, Amy Tyson, is the cable industry at parity when it comes to regulation with maybe the television in, or the telephone industry or other industries? You know, I think it's really, it's been an interesting evolution. Um, I think with the 96 Act, there was a real focus on competition. I think with our prior FCC chairman, there was a lot of um, focus on just cable video. Um, and some of these, um, uh, some of our competitors are not small. They don't, they're not in nascent businesses. And I, I guess I kind of scratch my head as to why, um, why the ILEX would be allowed to amalgamate even more wireless customers without a blink of the eye, but then uh, cable mergers are held up for months and months. And, you know, is DirecTV and, or DBS, for example, are they still a new entrant 10 years later with 30% of the um, MVPD or multi-channel video marketplace? I don't think so. so Really, I'm, I'm in favor of a, a, of a level playing field for all players, but I think the government really, uh, to the extent possible, should try to stay out of picking winners and losers and putting their thumb on the scale to decide who uh, comes out on top. And finally, how do you keep up with the technology changes? Well, I have a great team. 
I have to say, and uh, I'm very proud of uh, our people at Ben Broadband and what they do. Um, I'm involved in Cable Labs, of course. That's a specification standard setting body for the cable industry, and that's a huge resource for our business to um, help make technology affordable. Uh, and get us all on the same page in terms of where the vendor community needs to go to make sure that we're there with next generation products when the customers are ready for them. Amy Tykeson, Chairman, CEO of Ben Broadband out of Oregon, a small cable operator. Is, is that fair to say? That's right. Thank, Thank you. you, Peter. These interviews, by the way, took place at the Washington Convention Center in Washington, D.C. And for our final interview, we hear from an international perspective with Michael Lee. He's the Chief Strategy Officer for Rogers Communications, which offers service throughout Canada. Rogers Communications is a telecommunications company in Canada, and Michael Lee is their Chief Strategy Officer, and he's here down in Washington, D.C. at the National Cable Television Association's annual show. Mr. Lee, what's the difference between running a cable company or a tele uh, telecommunications company in Canada as opposed to the U.S.? I think it, it's it's very very similar actually um, because you know we, we share a lot of common media so you know the the environment's very similar the customers are very similar in the sense that they really really love their TV really really love their data you know still use phones in our particular case they also use mobile phones um, there are some uh, subtle differences I think uh, you know in in the Canadian marketplace. Uh, we want to make sure as Canadians that we, we get access to a lot of uh, Canadian content, Canadian stories. And so uh, we do have a, a slightly different um, content of programming offering than we see here in the, uh, in the U.S. And I think the regulation kind of reflects that uh, subtly. Uh, and I don't necessarily think that it's uh, at, when you're a consumer that you necessarily notice, but you know when we operate the business, there are subtle differences uh, uh, between the two countries. And speaking of the regulation, is it mandated that X number of Canadian channels be carried in a basic package? Is that how it's done? We do. Historically, uh, when they've licensed services to be uh, carried in, in Canada, uh, they've looked at the, uh, the services and made sure that there were uh, a sufficient number of Canadian services as well as a sufficient quantity of Canadian content within those services. So you'll see uh, very similar brands uh, between, our, uh, between Canada and the U.S., but the programming schedule might look a little bit different because of the nature of the Canadian Canadian aspect of it. Is our American programs in demand in Canada? Oh, highly. If you, if you look at the uh, best programming or the, the top rated programming uh, in Canada, uh, you'll see uh, almost identical, the same programming that's available in the U.S. So the, the shows, you know, the culture is very similar and the shows uh, have the same level of demand. The only difference is you might see uh, Canadian Idol versus American Idol or a show like So You Can Dance might be done with Canadian uh, Canadian people as opposed to Americans. Uh, Michael Lee, some of the regulatory issues that have been talked about in the U.S. dealing with telecommunications, uh, decency standards, uh, net neutrality or network management, um, are those issues in Canada also? Um, uh, let me take each of them individually. Uh, decency is not as significant an issue. Um, I, I don't think we have the same level of sensitivity uh, as uh, the U.S. market has with regards to the same issue. Um, we do see from time to time um, some complaints in particularly radio for some reason, but across the board I think uh, you have a more liberal view uh, with regards to um, what, uh, what's, what's a community standard, what's acceptable. Um, with regards to net neutrality, um, I think the, the similar concerns exist within the Canadian marketplace. We do see uh, some people and some customers who have uh, you know, an interest in making sure that the, the networks uh, are made available and kept available to, uh, to the people. Um, I think there's a subtle difference in that uh, the CRTC in Canada, which is our equivalent of the FCC, uh, actually in the regulation has jurisdiction uh, against uh, undue preference, uh, unreasonable use. And so I think that with that, um, we have a slightly modified discussion about the issue because um, the Canadian regulator has the, the ability to, to act if, the, if, if something does happen. And in this particular case, you know, it's kind of a theoretical issue because no one's really, there's, there's no real examples of, you know, net neutrality specific issues. And as a result, it's, it's a theoretical uh, discussion at this point. Well, even though you're in Canada, do you follow or at least keep an eye on what our FCC is doing? 
Oh, no question. No question. I think that, that probably is a, is a common theme for almost all things in Canada. When you're so close, largest trading partner, very similar culturally, you know, have to be respectful of each other's sort of uh, differences and commonalities. We definitely do follow what's going on with the FCC and, and make sure that we understand uh, how it potentially uh, could have impact uh, in the Canadian marketplace. Where are your growth markets for Rogers? So uh, Rogers, uh, most people think of us as a large cable company, uh, but in fact, we're actually a very large wireless company um, that has a very large cable operation. So we're the largest wireless uh, carrier in Canada, we're the largest cable carrier in Canada, and we have a lot of media assets. I think when you look at the three businesses, uh, there's still very strong growth in cable. You know, we still see a lot of, uh, a lot of healthy growth left in people wanting more programming services, more access to internet, uh, more voice. Um, in wireless, the, uh, we're just now going through this um, uh, next explosion of growth for wireless data services. Wireless the, as a business has primarily been a voice-based business for the longest time. We've just deployed our uh, next generation network. Uh, it runs at 7.2 megabits per second, so our 3G network. Uh, and we're seeing the demand on that just take off. And the media business, you know, the media business is, is a mature business, it's, which is looking at how do I extend my brand across multiple sort of distribution platforms and, and just try to continue to stay relevant with, uh, with subscribers. Has the current economic situation in the world hurt your business? You know, as, as we were talking before, um, Canada's largest trading partner is is, uh, is the U.S. and you know as the U.S. economy goes, it does have definitely impact in the Canadian economy, particularly in segments like uh, the auto sector. Um, but um, the underlying sort of subprime issues that we see in the Canadian market, in the U.S. marketplace, have not manifested itself in Canada. So it, it definitely you know people are concerned, uh, and rightfully so. I think there's there's uh, you know things to be concerned about but uh, we don't see the same level of uh, problems that we see here uh, in the U.S. Do you see, Michael Lee, uh, Rogers growing in an international way? A, are you allowed to uh, work in the U.S.? Would you be allowed to develop in the U.S.? And is it a market for you? You know, it's, it's funny. Um, well, we were at one point the largest MSO in North America. We actually owned uh, U.S. cable, com uh, cable uh, systems. We owned uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul. Portland, San Antonio, back in the franchising days, Ted Rogers, who was the founder, uh, who has just passed, he, he was in the U.S. Uh, franchising and building out systems. Um, we uh, sold those systems to invest in the wireless business, uh, which in hindsight was a very good decision for us. And um, I think at this point, when you look at the scale of the U.S. marketplace, you know, there's uh, less opportunities to, to enter into the U.S. marketplace, but, um, you know, this, this world, this day and age, you know, who knows? Could a Comcast or a Cox work in Canada? So the, in the reverse, uh, there are uh, foreign ownership restrictions in Canada. So uh, Canadian uh, telecom cable companies uh, need to have a certain percentage Canadian ownership um, to be able to operate in Canada. And so there is there are restrictions. There's no restrictions for them to invest in Canada. There are restrictions uh, in their ability to basically own, wholly own and operate in Canada. So who, who's your competition? Our competition is very similar to what you see in the, in the U.S. marketplace in terms of structure. Uh, uh, telephone company, Bell Canada, a uh, very good competitor, is our primary competitor in uh, voice, data, video, and wireless services. Uh, and we also have, uh, in this particular case, uh, Bell is also the largest uh, satellite distributor in Canada. So they, they're not only the largest uh, telephone company, but they also operate the, the largest satellite uh, uh, TV service in Canada. And we also have one other uh, uh, satellite operator in Star Trucks. When did you go through the HD transition in Canada and has it been successful? So um, we have uh, offered HD uh, for, I would say at this point, probably running five, six years. Um, Roughly about 30% of our digital base actually has our high def service, and we have, you know, uh, probably 50 plus video service HD video services today. Um, we have not done uh, the transition that you've seen, the digital transition that we're you're contemplating in the U.S., where we'll actually shut down analog. Um, that is for us a um, uh, a 2011 time frame uh, event, um, and I think you know just as we've seen here. Um, 
that uh, people love high definition. Uh, and we've, we've always felt that high definition was one of the ways that we could demonstrate to people uh, who are our customers that we provide the best possible service. So we've been very supportive. Customers have really, really responded well, and we look forward to more high definition content. Have you learned uh, from the US experience? Um, always, always. Uh, you know, I, we try to, to um, learn what's going on in, in, the, in the US experience, bring back the things that are relevant, because there are some, some differences uh, in Canada. And uh, we're looking forward to uh, seeing the digital digital migration and, and see how that applies into the Canadian marketplace. And finally, Michael Lee, what is your main focus as Chief Strategy Officer? Yeah, our my focus is uh, you know we have we're, we're a very fortunate position. Um, we, we're in cable, which is a great growth business. We're in wireless, which is a great growth business. We have great media assets that not only are good standalone business but help support the rest of the cable and wireless uh, franchises. And um, my focus now is, okay, what's next? You know, where does advanced advertising fit into this? Where does, you know, uh, um, um, not only just target advertising, but interactivity on the television so that we can make, and also broadband distribution of video to mobile platforms as well as PC so that we can make sure that we have the most relevant products for our customers so they can continue to grow and use more and more of our services and be increasingly more satisfied and, and happy. Michael Lee of Rogers Communications, thank you. Thank you. These interviews and others can be seen on our communicators website. If you go to the cspan.org website and click on the button marked series, you'll find a link for our program and there you can watch all of our archived interviews. Next weekend on the communicators, we'll focus on those who work with the technology behind cable operations. Thanks for watching.